Welcome back to Seek Strength and welcome back to Seekistan. Welcome back to the Seekistan new show. Today's new show is brought to you by the Seek Strength app on iOS and Android. Because of the massive lifts, we're starting off with weightlifting. Maybe you need to check out the Seek Strength weightlifting program. Maybe you need to check out the Clean program. Maybe you need to check out the Snatch specific programs on the Seek Strength app. Dynamic loading adjustment, coach bot, video library, program library, contact form, Facebook group, weekly live feedback on your lifts or your question now starting off we have mr carlos nazar the bulgarian great the one and only the probable gold medal at the olympics i didn't think it was possible but he's looking even more jacked than he looked two or three weeks ago weighing in at 90 kilos he competed at the bundesliga uh, unofficial world record, so 226 kilos, which have been three kilos over his own world record. He attempted 224 at the World Cup just gone in Thailand, missed the jerk twice, and he weighed in, did the Bundesliga. We've seen him doing this all the way along, and he put up this 226. So a couple of people said he was 90 kilos, someone else said he was 91. Near as means very little difference for, mm. for Carlos. I don't think this is the main reason he's making that. So 226 kilos. I'd love to know, the, so this jerk looks so much easier than obviously the last two missed jerks. I'd love if there were any, or I'd love to know if there were any extenuating circumstances uh, at the World Cup, if there was any food issues, anything like that. But this looks to be a very, very easy jerk for him. This would be kind of what 215 looked like for him just a few weeks ago. So Carlos is still 19 years old. And he did this 226 clean on jerk, so it was an 89. And he accompanied this with a very close attempt at 183, which would have been one kilo over Jason Lopez's snatch world record, but he missed it behind. So to put the total, just in terms of people are kind of talking about it, it's the 80s again, which is kind of funny. So the all-time world records in the 90 kilo class was a whopping 195.5 kilo snatch by Blagoy Blagoyev. And then the clean and jerk was an absolute whopping 235 kilos by Anatoly Karapati. Karapati? I can't and I really pronounce second name. So Blagoy is still around and kicking in Bulgaria, but Anatoly was Kazakhstan, a Kazakhstan, and he died in a motor accident. A motorcycle accident in his 40s, actually. So, Carlos, just to put that into perspective, as someone brought it up, now Carlos obviously is still one of the best lifters of this mm. generation, but what do you think this 183 fits? I think the start position of his snatch is something that always interests me. You really see how long his shin bones are in comparison to his femurs in that start position of the snatch. It's undoubtedly very close. It's undoubtedly a lift that he'll probably exceed at the Olympics. But it does, his snatch technique is something that's always interests me or it's always something we've talked about. It is a kind of major point anytime we see Carlos lifting is that he has those kind of technical anomalies and he's still, tr he's still making it work. Obviously, he's making those massive totals. But you really do see it in the snatch, those certain aspects that might be uh, it might be possible to clean them up in a quite quick period of time and you'd almost certainly see those lifts skyrocketing after that. So the pursuit of tactical perfection weightlifting is a process that all lifters are. The best lifters are always pushing it and it's something that at all levels, if you want to lift the most related to your capacity, tactical perfection is one of the most important aspects in weightlifting. Now you might make the mistake and sometimes lifters make this mistake and really maybe sometimes younger fans or newer fans if you've just gotten into the sport and you hear someone talking about Carlos's technique and you're like that's technique's got some issues it's not great you, you might feel a little bit of psychopathic fervor you might be a little bit mad that someone is saying that their technique is bad but relative to that lifter's own lifting they can improve relative to themselves so the lift they're doing might seem so monumental that their technique must be perfect but this is not the case the, I can guarantee you they're trying to improve and work on his technique. It's just a lot harder at heavier weights improving it. So this could mean all the difference. A bit of a technical improvement could improve this by two to three kilos. So there's clearly he's strong enough to make this lift. Clearly he has the capacity to make this lift. So we're only left with technical issues to correct. And it makes all the difference when you're looking for world records. For a newer lifter, that technical improvement might mean 20 kilos over two years in your snatch. And for Carlos, it might mean one extra kilo on the platform for a world record. So... The stakes are all totally different. The absolute value might be much different. It might look as much, but that extra kilo means a whole lot for those lifters, for those elite lifters. So improving upon it, 
they might not even improve their max they might just repeat their maxes from training on the platform more consistently so there's so many reasons to have that better technique and this kind of where it comes into the issue with carlos but obviously the lifts are still huge and it's a testament to his just capacity to be an amazing weightlifter i think the last thing when you're looking at carlos's snatch here if you're an amateur weightlifter or if you're somebody who just enjoys doing the snatch and clean and jerk movements in the gym we always talk about the importance of position and particularly the starting position and the catching position and you'll see here how much range of motion Carlos ekes out of that catch position you see how vertical his torso is these things are absolutely vital and they're things that can be improved upon constantly in the kind of amateur populations particularly but just getting that deeper squat that more vertical torso that better balance in the bottom position now something that's happening here obviously is the barbell is moving backwards so the weight is moving back towards his heels and you get this kind of artificial position where the shins are a bit more vertical as he kind of sits back with his weight on his heels a bit more but certainly if you are somebody who likes doing the snatch that catch position and being as deep as he is with as vertical a torso as he has would be so, so beneficial for everyone. Then we have Leo Wawa or Giga Chad. So he put up this very unusual complex that we just don't really see Chinese athletes doing, especially in the clean and jerk, was a clean front squat and two split jerks. So the Chinese method of coaching for a long time was quite secretive and it was a little bit of a mystery if you were involved in weightlifting over a decade ago involved in what they did in their programming what they did in terms of their loading and as things grow and get bigger everything comes to light and basically everyone does very very similar things most of the stuff looks much more similar than it is different and we were always kind of worried about these technical nuances but once you understand a bit more about lifting the the technique is the technique and these technical nuances are, are very small minor differences that don't make a huge difference in regards to technique as long as we're obeying the good principles but seeing this a couple of years ago wouldn't have would have been a massive surprise to see them do a clean front squat jerk jerk this is almost very soviet very very russian and on the lift itself from giga chad it's a sweet set it's so nice oh, to look at it's absolutely gorgeous i think this will go down as one of those lifts that a lot of people will watch hundreds of times before training or after training and really focus on the technique the big thing that stands out for me here his jerk is always very good always very very solid uh, but just how short and aggressive his dip and drive is here the unfortunate thing for most of us is unless you're clean and jerking 180 190 200 kilos that shorter dip and drive isn't as effective but you really see how effective it is here when that weight really impacts the barbell, really puts a lot of bend and stores a lot of potential energy in the barbell, and just how aggressively that pops up off his chest. Uh, the unfortunate thing, as I said, though, is that unless you're doing those crazy weights, that short and sharp a dip and drive probably isn't all that effective. The interesting thing here is there's also a new colorway of the Anta 2s, and I'm kind of liking them. I do. I could see myself wearing them. Mm. So the Anta 2s... The Lishtungs, the first Lishtungs, and I think there might be one more pair of shoes yet that I haven't tried that are kind of bigger shoes, but the Anta 2s are quite interesting and need to actually give those a go soon. Uh, preferably the gold and black ones he had, but it's also interesting to see there's a new colorway going on the shoes. Next up, we have got Kedemar, the fridge from, well, technically down under as well in South America, mm. down under for us. So he's working up to 210 kilo block clean. So Kedemar is, of course, an 89 kilo lifter. And he works up to these block cleans. We see him do these block cleans quite regularly in the last few months. He's, of course, known for his exceptional squatting. Moved down from the 96 kilo class after the Tokyo Olympics. And he is, you know, a, a monster in terms of weights, specifically in that clean and jerk. So he's a very good jerker when he gets those weights up. The crazy thing on this, when you're watching it, the block variation really gives you a a kind of magnified view of that really specific foot movement he has before he starts pulling on the barbell. So he goes from what you consider to be pretty standard pull stance, maybe a bit wide of a pull stance, into this very narrow, very toes out pulling position. Now, his pulling position with his feet looks pretty similar to this on the normal full lifts, but I think we just get a, a kind of more emphasized view here or a more clear view of that foot positioning on the blocks 
Now, clearly doesn't hurt his pull under because that pull under the barbell is incredibly fast, incredibly aggressive. It's very, very good. That timing of the catch and the clean obviously is something that the use of blocks can really help with because it allows us to clean heavy weights very consistently for a lot of volume. And you see that timing really kind of paying off here. No messing around in the bottom, very consistent positions, very easy on the stand up from the clean. So very nice lift normally when we see that foot change in position in pressure so from the front foot to the heels or we see the feet actually changing in the angle that they're pointing at in the pull it's usually a mobility issue or an incorrect pressure issue during the pull sometimes people have mobility issues that force them to do this as they're pulling sometimes we'll see a unilateral change so only one limb will change angle or sometimes then we'll have incorrect pressure during the pull and it will change for the negative in this case it doesn't seem to be a mobility issue Katemar seems a very good mobility and it's probably not a pressure issue it's probably a learned habit now these one of those things which isn't great normally for lifters because it can be quite inconsistent and we want to make the start position as consistent as possible for Kedemar. I think it's probably just a, a technical nuance and it is, like Dara said, kind of exacerbated on the block lifts. Now, next up, we've got Aaron Williams, the USA super heavyweight, and he's doing one of the CrossFit or the Rogue Challenge, I think, where it was a power clean, front squat, thruster, and jerk. And I don't know if anyone expected him to do it, but he came in and did it at 200 kilos. It's it's funny. Like Obviously, these are non-competition side lifts, and so you see them more rarely. And I think because of that, then, they stand out in your mind a small bit more. But this really kind of throws me back there or makes me think about that old style of almost circuit style lifting where they're really leaning back into it obviously if you're doing maximal thrusters that's going to end up happening but he controls it very very well um i i hazard a guess at saying he probably doesn't do these all that often in training because they're probably incredibly fatiguing but it is it's it's very entertaining to watch these kind of challenges happening i think there was some money for these before but i'm not sure if they're still doing that there was i think there was a thousand pound challenge as fast as possible you never see who ends up winning them so mm. i wonder if does the money actually go out to people or is it one of those challenges there was a very funny challenge there recently from a gym in the middle east which was an absolutely insane challenge it was literally impossible it was a squatting challenge it was impossible and it was for a hundred thousand us dollars and they showed an individual doing it but it was very clearly fake weights it, it was like simply impossible challenge like it was something like 20 reps at a uh, 200 kilos then rest 30 seconds and 20 reps like 180 kilos it was it was clearly uh it was like a pyramid up and down wasn't it yeah but you only like minutes rest between things it's crazy stuff yeah fully impossible I think that's the problem as well with those remote style challenges is obviously most gyms will have noticeably recognized plates. In this case, Rogue plates or Elico plates or ZKC plates or whatever. But it comes to a point where do you start cutting that off? Is there only four brands of plates you're allowed to use? Do you have to check all the plates? Do all the plates have to come off the bar? It is a... Obviously, these challenges are cool. It's cool that companies run them and incentivize people to be lifting and competing against each other. But it's a very, very tough thing to police. Now, next up, we've got Peter Asionoyak or Asanoyak. Peter Asionok. Asionok is how you say it. Nailed it. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> the exceptional technician from Belarus, incredible lifter, competing as an 89 kilo lifter at the moment. And we've got a 225 kilo rack jerk from Petter. Now, we've never seen Petter's best clean and jerk, or probably we've seen some heavy clean and jerks from we've seen, I'm sure, a 220 clean and jerk. We've seen lots of 180 snatches, but this, I think, is probably the biggest jerk we've seen from him at 225, and it is beautiful. Such a nice jerk. This is Chef's Kiss. Absolutely gorgeous. The big major standout point here for me, and it's something that a lot of the time on the heavy maximal jerks we don't see all that great is the wrist position overhead. A really nice stacked wrist position. No kind of compensation by tucking the knuckles back or opening that wrist up to a non-ideal position. Just such a nice punch through position. Wrist stacked on top of elbows, elbows on top of shoulders. It is absolutely gorgeous. Another great point about Petter's lifting in the jerk is how important having a very mobile front rack is in, in terms of having a few extra degrees of external rotation, a few extra degrees of pronation in your forearm. 
in terms of how much you can transfer the power from your body and your torso into that overhead position. If there's just a little bit of tightness and you're putting a little bit too much emphasis in your grip, if you're holding that barbell a little bit too rigidly, more rigidly than you need to, if there's a bit of space between you and the barbell, if we can even out those, if we can widen that surface area underneath the barbell, if we're in a looser position with our hands but still holding the barbell, we can get such a freer and more powerful transfer of force from our lower body, repeatable, probably less prone to pain in that front rack position if we can mobilize and the mobility thing is something we've been kind of thinking about a lot recently and how you can actually improve it and we'll have a longer video coming on that and the mobility is something that people really forget how important it is to train some people it comes quite easily for their whole weightlifting career for most people you'll see most elite weightlifters will spend anywhere from a half an hour to an hour today doing stuff that relates to mobility whether it's massage or stretching before training they'll have someone do it dr steph from the chinese national team talked about that the lifters will sometimes do way more than they're asked to do for the soft tissue work and they'll walk on each other or sit in the sauna for longer up to an hour two hours three hours of massage to eke out any extra benefit and suppleness for the tissues and it is something that should be considered as much work as your strength training in the gym sometimes if you need to improve on it and P. Petter does a great job of those positions. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point actually. A lot of the time we'll see the international level competitors with phenomenal range of motion, really good suppleness across their entire body and a lot of the time people think they put it down to that kind of genetic potential or the fact that they're training all the time and they have time to be doing it. The amount of hours that they put into their mobility work all the time even if you listen to that podcast with dr steph hours and hours per day working on that suppleness that looseness that ability to go through those full range of motion i say you know sticking with petter we have also got this 270 kilo back squat double we have seen a 300 kilo back squat from petter a couple of years ago so this 270 kilo for double is probably a right around where he's keeping it and he always has such a very very aesthetic back squat really nice even distribution between his hips and his quads as he's squatting has a little bit vertical forearm position but testament to his upper back positioning and his leg strength and his torso strength it doesn't affect him at all and here it seems to be a little bit less vertical than usual in terms of the forearm angle but he is a beautiful squatter yeah, I think you could look up the Olympic squat in the dictionary and this is what would come up. Yeah, the modern day York bar barbell Bible. Yeah, it is absolutely perfect. In terms of if you want to model your high bar back squat, particularly for Olympic weightlifting, off anybody, I think Petter is a phenomenal uh, use case or a lovely framework for you to be following. That training hall has definitely seen some of the biggest lifts of all time. Mm -hmm. You know, you've uh, Andrew Ramnoff training there. Andrew Rebicu training there, lots of great lifters. And of course, we've a Petter trained there as well, who's put up some massive training lifts also. Next up, we've got Antonio Vital e Silva, mm -hmm. a Portuguese lifter. Now, I'm not sure what weight class he's in. It's like somewhere it listed in his profile at 109 and 109 plus. But here's a 205 kilo clean. And there is some speed and power going into that second and third pull as he's getting under. Oh my god, yeah. I hadn't seen any of his lifting previously, but it is the acceleration of the bar, how smooth that extension is, and just how well he pulls under is really kind of exemplary. We always talk about people deviating the bar away by making too much contact or that barbell drifting forward because during their pull they're just focusing on putting a lot of speed in at that point of contact. You'll see here the kind of ideal case where the barbell is smoothly accelerating during the first and second pull. There's no massive emphasis on that contact, although contact undeniably happens and occurs here. But this is just how vertical you can get that bar path to be. And obviously, astronomical weights, very, very athletic in terms of how well he gets underneath the bar. But this would be one of the major coaching points. If you're one of the seeker strength athletes and you're getting feedback from Owen and I during the week and we're talking about that consistent acceleration, not a, a kind of uni speed pull and then a big smash at the end, this is really what we want to see. If they're the old school strength shot bumble knee, knee wraps, they're the closest thing these sleeves are the closest thing you can get to knee wraps from these sleeves. They are uncomfortable to wear if you've ever tried them. I tried them on once and I took them off immediately because they were cutting off all blood supply to my calves. <laughs> but if they are those old school bumblebee ones, they are 
fully IPF illegal, I would say. They used to be everywhere. That's what I like about weightlifting is that nothing really matters. They used to have a rule where you had a certain thickness and length of knee wrap and belt, and the knee wrap thing was like you couldn't double wrap. But it doesn't make a difference as long as the barbell goes overhead, so mm. oftentimes it's not as much a benefit. So now there's just no real rules in the, the lower body. Because, speaking of that, we've got Beck Timur, who is a Turkmen lifter, and he's gone for the classic Uzbek style. We saw Klonkov do a little bit of that as well with that knee wrap, where you're just wrapping the whole quad. Mm. But he's a 73 kilo lifter, and he's got this excellent set of 182 hang cleans above the knee into a split jerk on the hang clean. Exceptional hang clean. Beautiful technician. Superb. I, I love those hang cleans. Top class. They look like you've sped up that video by 150%. It's just, it looks a bit too fast for normal hand cleans. They are absolutely brilliant examples of what you should be doing. Now, obviously, we've talked about people using wraps in the clean, or sorry, pulling straps during the clean and the possible dangers that come along with that. But obviously, in this case, if you are Bechtmore, you have all of that knowledge, all of that motor skill behind you. And the risk for somebody like this is obviously far, far less than the risk of a, an amateur weightlifter or those of us who don't train full time. We were speaking in the last few weeks about the technical prowess of many of the Turkmen lifters and how well they're getting on. It really has been like a kind of polarized or a, a complete 180 on their their technique in the last number of years or just how well this particular crop of lifters are moving i'd love to know if anybody knows anything about their coaching structure or who's running their system at the moment we would be incredibly interested to know if you could pop it down in the comments or send us an email we'd be very very interested so in terms of the hand clean this is how you want to be doing your hand cleans a lot of times we can turn a hand clean into one of two issues we can end up doing a hip clean where we just look at the oscillation of the barbell and it's not really that useful a lift. It can be useful sometimes, but it's certainly not useful as the hand clean. Other times then we can turn the hand clean into a really hip smash. In terms of the hand clean, we drop down, we make a huge space between the barbell and the lifter. We bump into the barbell, we slow down the barbell, we chase the barbell forward. Neither of which Bechtemer is doing here. He's pulling it in nice and closely with his straps. And as you say, they've done a complete 360 with their technical model, you know? Moving on, we have, next up, we have got Tu Yi, who is a Chinese lifter. He's an 89 kilo lifter. This was put up by Kurt Album, one of the other great social medias who put up great videos. And I wonder why my Instagram videos never look like this. Why do I look like 80K, 8K? But this is 180 kilo power clean and jerk, and it is wapow. That power clean makes me feel things in my soul. Kapui. I, if I never, ever got to touch a barbell again, but I got to do a power clean that looked like that at a weight anywhere near approaching 180 kilos, I would sell my soul to the devil and do it. <laughs> I would have no bother. That is, this is just, sometimes you look at a lift and it just stands out to you and it hits that certain area in your brain and you're like, that's it. That's exactly how I want it to look. This is exactly how I want my power clean to look or more importantly, how I want our athletes' power cleans to look. This is unbelievable. Obviously, he has the massive added performance enhancer here of having the singlet on, but it's only just pulled up around the belt, which is immediately probably 15 kilos extra. Well, if I could have something from the video, it would be his right elbow lockout <laughs> you know what's interesting about the chinese lifters is they almost always certainly in the provincial teams always have pecs like they always have yes. some deities on them you know i have seen them doing a lot of weighted push-ups and a lot of dips there's never a bench in the gym and if there is they're just sitting on it you know we don't yeah. ever see them doing it so lots of weighted push-ups lots of deficit feet elevated weighted push-ups as well which is a great variation yeah and it is it shows off in the the chesticle. Absolutely. Here we yeah. are. Yeah. Well endowed in the chest. Now, we've got Nino Pizzolato up here. Nino is, of course, Carlos's main rival in the 89s coming into Paris. Nino's had a termumptuous, a turbulent time over the last 18 months or so. We've seen some good lifts from a couple of months ago at Europeans, and then we saw not so great in Thailand. 
So this is a 260 kilo front squat double, and this is definitely the best he's looked in a long time. I don't know if we've seen a heavier front squat. I'm actually, I think this might be the heaviest front squat demonstration from Nino, and in typical Nino fashion, superb technique, mm. really consistent, zero tactical breakdown. Mm. Barbell speed slows down, which is what you want. You don't want barbell speed to keep going at the expense of tactical positions. Certainly not in the clean. So Nino does a great job of demonstrating that. Yeah, I really, I really like Nino as a lifter. I really like his technique. I liked watching him lift. And I hope to God he is, this is the kind of start of that big building phase for the Olympics. I really hope he peaks well at the Olympics. Obviously, as Owen was saying, the last few months he's been in some kind of stormy waters in terms of those competition or qualifying competition performances. But things are looking great here. To be honest, if you... It's it's a bit hard to reconcile what we saw a few weeks ago to how good this squat looks, um, which is strange. That's just the way international competition goes. But he still has a bit of time, not a massive amount of time by any means, but there is still enough there for him to get a good training block in and hit some major numbers and push Carlos a bit. So we've got May, June and July, all of those. And then we've got about half of August, if I remember right, I think. Maybe is it the 18th, the 20th, they're starting, something like that in the weightlifting. And so for Nino, he's in a great position because there's going to be no travel issues, no travel sickness. Same with Carlos, you know, it's literally mm. a probably two or three hour flight, two hour flight maybe to Paris from where he is. Like Nino could drive there within the same day pretty easily. So it is a, um, you know, he's got that advantage. So you get a little bit more time, whereas... When lifters were traveling from Europe to Brazil, it was a big change, big change in atmosphere and humidity and temperature and time zone and food. And that just everything was different, you know, on top of it being the Olympics. So you've got this travel time adjustment, you've got the anticipation of travel. So every week there becomes a little bit more precious and the more familiar you can get with your environments, the better. So even those couple of hours closer to home all pay in when you're lifting the big boy weights and the big boy stage. Now... Speaking of the big boy stage. What what a lift. So Super Soldier, once again, with the risky exclusive, I think. We had that 210 clean and jerk. Mm -hmm. I don't know where he got it. And he got this 200 kilo squat jerk. Would never have expected this from Rizki. No. But looking at his 190 snatch balance, it does kind of make sense. So this is a 200 kilo squat jerk from Rack. Rizki, of course, is 73 kilo lifter. And what the frick? I was kind of speechless. I was thinking about this lift and thinking about obviously the really heavy snatch balance we saw last week and it, it's kind of crossover there. But I don't know what to say, Owen. It looks, it doesn't, it shouldn't look that easy. It really shouldn't. I don't have anything to say really, to be <laughs> honest. I just don't understand how he's squat jerking 200 kilos, but it makes, it's happening, it's there. It's there. It's undoubtedly there. I kind of like that he's gone for all the tens as well. That's just like, oh. put on the tens, put on the tens, put on the tens. Do you like that? I respect it in training because I would probably do it for myself if I was doing something like that, maybe. You would definitely do that. I, what I if get into the habit... a stack of tens next to the thing. Oh, 100%. A little toaster rack. Keep pulling them off. Like, what I do in training is I get into the habit of loading the barbell the same way all the time. Oh, yeah, that's what I like. So the exact same. So I probably wouldn't end up doing it unless I knew I was only working up. So if I'm like doing the same thing, when I was doing five by fives all the time in the squad, it was always the same... Same loading. The last thing you want to do is think about something different. I then take those plates off the bar and leave them in the inverted stack right next to the bar. So when I load them on, it's the exact same way every time. This is correct. Yeah. This is the way. Anyway, risky with the 200 kilo squat jerk. Don't have any tactical feedback for the squat jerk because obviously you shouldn't be squat jerking. Squat jerking is for the devil. Now, moving on to our powerlifting section, strength section. We've got Colton the Limit Breaker again. And lots of people are sending in Colton into the new show via the DMs. And here is a 410 kilo by four low bar back squat. Colton is 23 years old and his body weight in this video, he said it was 110 kilos. Now, me and Dara were talking about this before we read the caption. We said they look a little bit high, not like egregiously high, mm. but they don't look like they're powerlifting depth. And he said depth was shitty, I know, but I'll still take this PB. Got to make my sure my hips feel good for next week. So... Part of the thing is very, very interesting. We'll see lifters sometimes, you know, not squatting quite to depth in training and, and it'll be there in the competition. A lot of times it doesn't work out for some lifters. It does work out completely fine. The other thing I think is really interesting is that in this style of low bar, so Colton has a 
a great style of low bar for maximizing leverages and hitting perfect depth. So if you wanted to do it as deep a squat as possible, this would be a terrible way to squat, but to hit just below the parallel and still be in a great position, this is fantastic. But what we often see is it does put a lot of pressure on lifters' hips. Mm. Uh, it's a huge demand on that external rotated position. We're kind of almost restricting any internal rotation to the bottom, which is one of the ways we get deeper into the squat. We're trying to keep that position open and even if you've exceptional hip sockets and you've great tissue pliability when you're lifting these weights for this repetition and putting that through that is one of the points where we see that issue you know if you're looking at weightlifters and they're high bar squatting you so rarely see hip issues it's always that knee maybe the patella sometimes it's the back issue but it's it's always the hips that seem to take a beating when we're in these kind of really wide low bar positions typically reserved for equipped lifters back in the DAY with those west side lifters and this kind of elite FDS lifters back when uh, powerlifting was cool according to a lot of old school powerlifters and you pit bulls in the gym yeah when you were just doing cocaine in the gym you know <laughs> the thing I really like at the moment is there's a handful of major kind of world level or world record level lifters who are all very aware of each other mm -hmm. very much going to the same competitions planning out their competitions where they'll meet. Like, you'll see Nick Dupree's is tagged here and they're talking to each other about teaching the way of the depth or whatever. Uh, but it is something that I feel like powerlifting in the years past, aside from the IPF level, but if we're talking about non-tested powerlifting federations, I think a lot of those athletes might have slightly missed out on the fact that they didn't have somebody who was there at those competitions competing against them lifting similar weights and doing it for five and ten year uh, spells rather we'd have one person peak hit massive lifts in one two three competitions in a row and then they kind of fade off again what we see at the moment with like sir dave we see it with nick dupree's obviously here we have colton and a handful of other lifters is all these guys are peaking at the same time. There's a pretty big age spread there, but they're all in great shape at the same time. They're all going to very similar competitions or in many cases to the same competitions. There's big cash prizes that motivate them to show up. But the other thing is, is they have their counterparts there showing up and there is more incentive to push those weights, more incentive to train more, train more consistently, stay in the game for a bit longer. And that is something in powerlifting. It's staying in the game for a while has its impact. You're very big. You're, there are health implications from being that big and all the other stuff that comes along with it. And it is just good to see that that level of competition is there to keep these guys involved, keep them training and keep them pushing hard against each other. Yeah, you get that really strong heartbeat, regular, just... <laughs> All day, every day. Yeah, you minimal heart rate variability, <laughs> big strong heartbeats. You can hit a heartbeat PB if you stick with <laughs> maximum powerlifting for a long time. Next up, we've got Deadlift Lord, aka Rondell Hunt, and he is doing what he's called the thousand thousand kilo by two total. So he squatted this three hundred fifty kilos for a double, benched two hundred fifty kilos for a double. So here's the two hundred fifty kilo bench, which is absolutely ridiculous, immaculate. Then, then he did a 400 kilo hook grip deadlift and then he switched to straps. He's calling the double, so I see maybe he just grabbed them or something and did a second rep with that 400 kilos. And this is, uh, for me, crazy. For me personally, this. For me personally, from, this blows my mind. In particular, the bench is crazy how easy he's yeah. doubling 250. But what I really like about this is the squat. The squat is so yeah. nice. That's the style of squat we were always kind of talking about that we we're looking for. Like when we teach people low bar squats and it works incredibly well is that just outside shoulder width stance, low bar of course, but we're still looking for those quads being the prime driver, really consistent back angle. The hips are certainly involved and they're taking a lot of the load, but we're not seeing them taking a dominant load. We're still seeing the knees kind of dictating those positions as much as possible or driving through the quads. And because of that low bar, we're in that slightly inclined position, so the ass is taking quite a bit mm. of that load for want of a better term. So then we get really great positions, and it works for a lot of people. You know, Colton squat, for example, is fantastic, but most people just can't squat like that, and most people can't squat like that for a very, very long time. This style of squat, especially, not saying anything about anyone anywhere at all, for the natural powerlifter, this, for, yeah. for Randall's style of squat, this is absolutely the best way we've seen from lots of different powerlifters from 
really lightweight classes all the way up to do the heavy boys the chonkers the thickers this style of squat works fantastic mm. and it's really consistent it works really consistently your training because you get lots of good quality reps in and it doesn't seem to beat them up as much and they seem to get better and heavier lifts out of it another thing a uh, kind of underrated skill when we see powerlifters bodybuilders weightlifters doing multiple reps in the squat a lot of the time their second third and fourth rep will be thrown off by the oscillation in the bar now this is showing his deadlift now but it will show the squat again in a sec and the big thing to watch for is how well he alleviates that that movement in the bar he steadies the bar again and goes immediately into the next squat so you'll see there's a lot of movement in the bar the bar is whipping around a lot it's moving on his back a lot but particularly between the first and second rep, he does a great job. He steadies the bar, he gets tight again, and he goes again for the second rep. And the standout thing on this is between his second rep and re-racking the bar, he does the exact same thing. Really stabilizes it well in his back, walks it into the rack. It's all very controlled, it's all very consistent, and undoubtedly that sort of stuff will pay off massively in your training long term. Now, next up, we've got the username is underscore Floyd underscore. He appears to be a South Korean bodybuilder. No idea what body weight he is. But what we do know is he's squatting 300 kilos for a set of six high bar in a commercial gym. And this is absolutely crazy. So those South Korean bodybuilders put up some massive weights, specifically mm. in the squat and the deadlift. Across the weight ranges, we see... Some of the lighter dudes, some crazy stuff. We that the power clean that one seventy with straps. If anyone remembers him, we've that one thousand tiger fella, and we've got Floyd here squatting two hundred kilos for six high bar, and this is crazy lifting when you think about it. If you think about it for a sec, this is one of my favorite things, or probably my favorite thing about internet lifting culture, is that you get to see athletes like this. Somebody who's not competing in powerlifting or weightlifting, as far as I'm aware. Uh, certainly not competing in federations that I'd be regularly watching, yet as part of their training, they're doing incredible squats. Very, very nice positions here. Obviously, the weight is amazing. The weight is something that most of us would never even dream of having on our back, but it is, uh, obviously, case in point, it is uh, something we, a uh, quick little window into their life, a quick little window into their training that really kind of transfers over to our world as weightlifting, powerlifting or SNC coaches. So we get to see it with bodybuilding now here. These are squats we'd never have seen before. We get to see it for the throwers, the track and field athletes. And it is for all the, the wrongs of Instagram and all the negative things about comments and, and all that mental health stuff. This is one of the good aspects of it. Certainly booty building, am I right, guys? All right, everyone calm down. Now, here we have got Ken Cooper, who has done the heaviest deadlift, heaviest raw deadlift in a raw powerlifting competition. So, Benedict, old Benny, ben, Benny Magnuson, still has the heaviest raw deadlift of all time which is crazy he did mm. that in 2010 which is mental yeah so he did 442 and a half that was in a meet with wraps and then ken did this in a raw part of the meet he did this 435 kilos benedict did 442.5 and this is it's the craziest thing about this lift was it reminded me of benny's lift yes and the fact that benedict's lift is still the heaviest raw deadlift of all time. Isn't that crazy? With all years later. With all the people we've lifting now, like yeah. way more stronger people across all those weight ranges. And still Benedict's brawl lift is still the heaviest lift. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it is. It actually blows your mind. It's like when we were talking about the, the 80s era being back in weightlifting and it not quite being back. It's I wonder how long it will take for that record to be broken. So I feel like there's lifters out there who can do it. Like yes. Ken, for example, is probably that lifter. Absolutely, yeah. It's not that much more. It's a pretty small percentage, but this 435 kilos isn't a huge stone throw from that 442 and a half. And he came back from double quad surgery. Did he did he tear both oh quads? God. So Ken possibly at points in his career thought he probably wasn't going to deadlift anything ever again. Yeah. Or do any total ever again. So the fact that he's hitting 435 kilos is absolutely insane lifting 
it has to be said again, like in the the description of this video, he talks about Sir Dave, he talks about Nick Dupreeze, he talks about other powerlifters who he's watching competing now. And this is how those big records are going to be broken, undoubtedly, is by amazing athletes like this pushing themselves harder and harder every week. The standout thing on this, just from a purely technical point of view, is when we look at his finish position at a deadlift, he is not one of these kind of crazy freaks who basically has their hands sitting at the same height as their knees when he locks out that deadlift. That deadlift is locked out when that barbell is two-thirds of the way up his quad. Like, he is bringing that power through a massive range of motion. Obviously, conventional, our personal favorite again. But it has to be said that it's... um. He's by no means one of these people with those crazy leverages. He's just an insane athlete with, with some amazing strength. Now, speaking of insane athlete with amazing strength, we've got BJ Stone, one of the most athletic strongmen out there. Other athletic strongmen come to mind would be the um, Maxon. Max Satar. Sam, sorry, not Sam. Sam. Max, Sam, Sam Sheeter, definitely one of the other really athletic strongmen yeah. currently going. But any anyway, on BJ, we had a hundred and forty kilo no contact muscle snatch, which is absolutely mental. That's the working weight we see Lasha moving around usually, and very few other people. So BJ, we've seen him do those huge power cleans, the belly power cleans. We've seen him do the really heavy push presses and power jerks. And it's so strange that he's even doing no contact muscle snatches, let alone with 140 kilos. What the, the really strange thing here is how fast the second pull is or how fast the end of the second pull is. Like, I think we see Lasher doing it. You don't notice a crazy change in speed, but you see such a crazy change in speed here. Well, I think the mental thing here is that, so obviously Lasha follows through with really high elbows and turns it over smoothly like mm. you would in the snatch or close to the snatch, whereas BJ does what Gabriel Sincrain calls a fast muscle clean and press, <laughs> and mm. where we see that really fast turnover to the press position. But normally lifters don't have such a strong pressing capacity or a lot of lifters don't, but BJ does. So then he just follows through even faster then on this pressing motion and keeps it smooth. His overhead position is so nice as well for a giant dude doing strongman. All right, my elbow isn't great. Like, stop rubbing it in. Jesus Christ, bring it up all the time. Yeah, BJ always has excellent overhead mobility and it is paying off when it comes to this kind of event or overhead positions and it comes back again what we're talking about with Petter the freer your tissues are the better you can hit those positions the faster you can get into them the more repeatable you can make them the more stable they are there's just no reason to be wound up or tight in positions that you'll be using in competition it takes a lot of work and it's hard to do but it pays off hugely if you can maintain it and get those good positions now speaking of positions and speaking of suppleness we have got from Martin Lisi's, another strong man, Strength Unknown series. He is he in Pakistan, in the mountains of Pakistan. He is doing a country I'd love to go to in the mm -hmm. mountains. We've been to the Himalayas before, but not in Pakistan. So anyway, we've got these lifters. He is doing a... Look, it's a 150 kilo low hang clean with an Atlas stone that's 150 kilos. And then he does two front squats. Goblet front squats, goblet squats, goblet squats with this 150 kilo Atlas stone. Interesting, with this Atlas stone, there's little holes. Mm -hmm. And then he does this low hang clean. The important thing is it can't touch the body on the way up or down. So it can only touch it oh, okay. when it's on the chest. What an insane feat of strength this is. A full clean as well. This is... I'd love to see these guys from this sport coming over and doing the real heavy Atlas stones from World Strongest Man and seeing how they handle them. We've seen a, a bit of a changing of the tide in terms of the world's strongest men competitors and strongman competitors, generally speaking, with a real technical focus now and a real technical focus on moving well around the implement rather than it just being bigger and bigger and bigger. We see a focus on better positions, better technique, maybe more of an influence of the kind of athletic side of, of training coming into it. And this... We've never seen strong men lifting like this to get that stone up over a over a bar or onto a box. I'd love to see what they could do if you got somebody the size of Haftar Bjornsson moving like this. What what's the ultimate weight here for one of those stones? So the really interesting thing about this is if we go back and watch the hang clean variant is he uses essentially a dynamic start while still in the hang position. So this is obviously something you'd never do weightlifting. You could do it if you wanted in that low hang position. 
is he's just essentially using something known as a stretch shortening cycle so pre-stretch muscles produce more force more power and the tendons attenuate that power from that and we see this sits down into the position comes up and then goes quickly back down into that position so it's an incredible feat of coordination and what's really interesting is just innate capacity to do that you know mm. uh, in terms of what feels right and doing that. Now, I'm sure there's obviously that's coaching. There's obviously a huge amount of history with this. So this 150 kilo stone lifting is crazy. There is a gentleman, Indiana Stones, in Ireland, who's going around mapping the positions of lifting stones around Ireland. And there's a lot of them there from different points in history. So I can't remember Indiana Stones' name, but he's a fluent Gaelgoer and he's been reading a lot of the old... Irish documents, he's able to see that it would be like uh, in Balavurna there's a church and yeah, there's a yeah, stone yeah. that people used to lift and uh, myself and Darren must go look at them. Get some the of wind the wind underneath it. Just uh, during the summer something, myself look at some of the ones nearby surely, but Martin Lisi's with the Strength Unknown series. My last favourite thing about this is how absolutely gigantic that man's hands are. <laughs> it's the only way. <laughs> My God. Now here we've got Ivana, I'm not saying her second name, that's, I won't get it right. And Spanovic, maybe that's right. So anyway, she's a triple jumper, and this is some of the most impressive jumping I've seen. A single leg jump, series of jumping, bounding on a single leg. The distance she's covering there, I'd have to guess, is a metre and a half, I think, each stride? And the, more, the long, maybe two metres? More, 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 yeah. And then the final jump, obviously, is massively impressive, but the, the bounding here is is insane just flat out not like most impressive jumping i've seen from women or men just as in terms of jumping i've ever seen this is absolutely crazy all on that left leg that's actually more than that must be nearly way more yeah is that three meters per strike that's fucking crazy yeah that looks like nearly three meters if not more it's uh, i'm not completely au fait or very au fait with the particular drilling or particular style of training just for the triple jump whether they the repeated bounds on a single leg is something that they do frequently in their training it would obviously make sense that they would have some sort of accrual of volume of single leg work but this as a display of athleticism i don't think we've seen jumping that's this impressive one. i genuinely don't think so if we have i don't think it's been on the news show this is insane levels of explosive power i need to try that i'm going to I'm going to try that sometime this week just to see how bad I am when I compare it to her. <laughs> My broad jumping ability just isn't as good, I don't think. As your vertical jump? I don't think so. Maybe okay. it's like I haven't practiced it a lot, but the my vertical's not bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, that's triple jump, the single leg. Unbelievably like. impressive. If you are involved in triple jump, I'd love to know if this is something you do in training or you see other triple jumpers doing in training, those repeated bounds on that same leg, but surely this is surely every triple jumper isn't doing that next we've got cameron rogers a hammer thrower from us we've seen obviously lots of cameron before and she did this 97 near enough 97 let me be a little bit over 97 kilo power snatch hang power snatch complex so sometimes it rustles some jimmies jimmy some rustles in terms of the uh the complexes throwers use we're always uh pretty impressed by what throwers are doing with 97 kilos yeah hang power snatch to standing so we've got these kind of touch and go high pulls maybe you could call them yeah you could call them touch and go high pulls might call them something similar to the korean pull a little bit and then straight into that hang power snatch or rebounding each repetition touch and going them into that overhead position at nearly 100 kilos 215 pounds an interesting thing here is wearing the shorts with the built-in quad protection it's something we've seen people commenting about of, oh, the bruise you must get on your quads or whatever it is. Obviously, a lot of time throwers just don't care. A lot of athletes don't care. They'll be picking up bruises from everywhere else anyway. But I remember in weightlifting a few years ago, we used to have the snatch shorts. I think it was John North brought them in and were for sale because he used to emphasize that massive contact on the pubic bone for his snatch but here we see i'm not sure if they're goalkeeper shorts or if they're football shorts with that built-in pad but certainly it's a good idea if you're doing those multiple times per week to be protecting the quad some way with that well also is interesting here is that they have such good weather all year round that they have an outdoor gym or they have stuff to lift outside which is something could not fathom 
in Absolutely Ireland. Absolutely no way. Where we get, I think it's 366 days of rain a year. What's going on with every thrower wearing Valesa weightlifting shoes? They just have their hands in there. Big Valesa. Now, sticking with throwers, we've got Johann Vetter, a javelin thrower from Germany. And we've seen him do some heavy hang power snatches before. We saw him do the 130 kilo triple. And we've got this 140 kilo hang power snatch. Win for the double, but he missed the second rep. But the first rep, obviously, is pretty crazy. Uh, again, more... Look, throwing technique, we've talked about it before. We don't think it's that major an issue as long as there's nothing bad happening for that lifter. He's still moving that heavy weight fast. But this is a 140 kilo hang power snatch is a rare feat among weightlifters. Oh my God, yeah. Especially when the first one is so easy, you just decide to go for a double. That's what he said, 140. Felt like nothing today, so I decided to do it twice. Um, And look, people talk about the catch position or the feet being so wide and it being dangerous. In In the case for most of us, that is definitely true. That is definitely true. If our feet were very wide, if we had one knee slightly valgus, one knee maybe slightly varus rotation, uh, maybe that is true. But when you're at the point where you're strong enough to be doing this, it's very likely all of those tissues have built up that resistance. They've built up that tendon thickness, that ligament thickness to be able to withstand those loads. So unless you're in the position where you've suddenly shot up and you were only ever doing 80 kilo hang power snatches and now today you're doing 140 in those cases there's obviously a risk which should be mitigated but for the case of these athletes they're doing these for years decades in many cases they've built up that strength and that integrity to be able to withstand a bit more force in those slightly non-ideal positions and so they get away with it uh, the other thing is is if you were to compare it to a weightlifter and maybe those non-ideal positions is the weightlifter is doing this every single day in many countries and in many systems, they're doing it two times a day or three times a day. For throwers, they're in the gym a handful of times per week, maybe four or five times per week. The level of stress and the re level of repetitive strain isn't equal to what a weightlifter would be doing in those very specific areas. So it is different. Everyone's case is different, particularly for the throwers and track and field athletes. They're just in a slightly different grouping from the weightlifters and particularly the amateur weightlifters. Again, just to reiterate, of course, that when we coach throwers and lifters and athletes in the Olympic lifts, we obviously coach them to the mm. best of our ability with that knowledge we have from weightlifting, but it's not the worst for these other athletes again you know it's not uh, it's not an apocalypse here we got Travon Trayvon Brommel running in 9.76 or that's his best PB so this is a, a start from him this start looks absolutely crazy it looks like there's a frame missing it's insane you know what this looks like is it looks like there's a piston behind his hips mm -hmm. and his hips push forward before everything else like his feet almost don't catch up with his hips here mm-hmm it doesn't make sense. Like we, It's a quite wide-angle view here, and we don't see it full-on. What I'd love to see is a 90-degree angle from the side, slow motion of this, and just see how quickly his hips carry him through that first two or three meters of the sprint. It is insanely fast. Obviously, in, in the start position and in those starting mechanics for the sprint, we'll see things like the toe drag. We'll see things like an elongated stance or an elongated stride where maybe we mightn't want that stride to be too elongated. But in this case, it's massively emphasized. Those hips go forward so fast. I've never seen a start position quite like this. I actually don't think the camera frames were able to pick it up. I keep watching it here, but think he's literally moving so fast that the frame just isn't included that he is moving so quickly yeah unless you slowed it down i'm sure it might be there but it really looks like from watching it in whatever frames per second we're watching it in here that he's just not that frame is gone because it's he moves rapid he moved too quickly between them it's insane speed from mm. trayvon brommel and obviously a 9.76 100 meter that start isn't holding him back too much i don't think me personally i think that's okay <laughs> I see, yeah i'd say he's doing pretty well now, lastly, we have got Linda, not saying it, that is a, <laughs> I'm not butchering Go this. Go on, no. make an attempt. Wyzeveski, maybe, Wyzeveski, it's a Polish bobslayer, and you might have seen this video of her jumping, so this was a 35-inch box jump, very, very, very impressive. We also had the, the nightmare of box jumps, the major problem with box jumps. Box jumps are a great exercise. They're really measurable in the gym, 
The only problem with box jumps is there's so many ways to hurt yourself and injure yourself that they are a nightmare. So when you're going for that heavy box jump, lots of people, lots of CrossFitters, if you're watching this, a lot of people have cut their shins on a car or on a plywood box. These are lifting blocks, so maybe jerk blocks or pulling blocks, and it is brutal, and you can take so much skin, and it takes so long to heal, or you can fall off backwards mm. and land on the floor. So that is a, a nightmare, and it's kudos for her for showing it and not obviously trying to hide it too much. Linda's a crazy athlete. Like, this is yeah. mental, superb levels of coordination. If you've ever done box jumps, running box jumps are so different. They're a different style of lifting. You take a lot of coordination. There, I say a little bit more athleticism to get right, similar mm-hmm. to that kind of dunking. So it's not only raw power, but to be able to coordinate that power and land in the box and from that running position. So generally, if you get very good at them, you should be able to do more with that running start. You build up some momentum. You are moving through those muscles so into that position then you get a little bit more of that stretch shortening a little preloaded muscles but it is a very very hard coordinated exercise if you just start doing it so it's very very impressive and that is no joke for a box jump height no absolutely like it is it's probably even more impressive than it looks one thing an interesting thing here is that uh, that initial kind of test so you know you're not going to jump up onto it but you're just seeing, can you get your feet up that high? And it is it is interesting. A lot of time we see box jumps being failed. They're being failed due to fatigue. And obviously in this case, this is a maximal effort. So there's risk there. You're going to be trying to push that height as much as you possibly can. But for a lot of the time we see box jumps being failed, it might be you're doing five box jumps in a row and on the third or fourth one you get a bit fatigued and then you trip over and split your shin in it or you might be doing them in a workout. And in those cases, they're not ideal. There, There's a lot of issues with them. But for maximal power output, they are just so, so valuable. And I think as well for most of us, the idea of jumping up onto a box gives you that bit more to aim for rather than just standing on the floor and trying to jump up as high as you can and kind of maybe you're tracking that with a jump mat not all of us have 1500 euro to spend on a jump mat maybe you're tracking it with a video and you've some measurable scale behind you that in itself is a bit more laborious or a bit more clunky in this case a box you know what the height of the box is maybe last week you didn't have one of those extra blocks on top maybe this week you put an extra plate on top or whatever it is and i think they're a great exercise particularly for something like bob said that's so explosive so dynamic they are really valuable so thanks for watching today's new show thank you for everyone who submits stuff for the new show for sending dms in we look through every single one of those each week takes quite a while so we make sure you know we want to respect people's time and you're putting the effort in so we really do appreciate your sendings in so we do check them and look at every one of them so thank you so much for that and remember today's new show is brought to you by the seek strength app on ios and android lots of great new features coming this year we're on version 11, I think. So we're leveraging about a new version every month. So we're always updating and trying to improve as much as possible. One of the great features from us and one of the great standouts for us from the app is the staying power of people on the app. So that's a big shore for app is that, especially a training app, is that people are staying on the app for a very long time. So that is hugely reassuring from my point of view. We want to make sure that we're improving the app as much as possible. And if you have any questions about it, Remember, you can try it out for seven days for free. There's no charge. Just end your trial before the seven days up. You can check out the programs, look around the app, and get a feel for it without having to be committed to any payment. So seven-day free trial is always on the app for everyone uh, across Android and Apple. So check it out down below in the links in the comments. Link in comments.